Science on the Menu, a podcast by the European Food Safety Authority. Hello and welcome to another episode of Science on the Menu. My name is Ed Bray and I work in the communications team at EFSA. And today joining me is Wolfgang Geltmann from uh, the Novel Foods team at EFSA. Hi, Wolfgang. Hello. Thanks for inviting me. I'm I'm really interested to talk about what we're going to discuss today. Um, we're talking about food, but not food as we know it. We're talking about food that is produced in a novel way, and that is from uh, cell lines. So cell-based fo- food, some call it lab-grown food. Uh, at EFSA, we prefer the term cell culture-derived food. When we hear about this, we often hear about it in terms of meat, uh, a replacement for traditional meat. So let's start off with the most basic question. What is cell-based food? What, how, how is it produced? Um, and, and, and where does it, what's the process actually for that? Yes, uh, when we talk about cell culture-derived food, we uh, understand these are foods based on cells that have an animal origin. So somewhere they must be sourced from an animal. Usually they are from farmed animals, or you can also source meat. So necessarily you do not need to slaughter an animal for this. You can also go to the slaughterhouse and, and take some um, meat, some muscle meat there, and, and collect cells, which then can be propagated um, under very closed conditions. We call it cell culture conditions. Um, in closed compartments uh, where you need to add water, nutrients, including vitamins, minerals, amino acids, sugar, um, even fatty acids, um, and water, oxygen. You also need to control the temperature. These cells are growing then in a highly monitored and controlled environment uh, to increase the, 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 the scale, the, the number of cells which then eventually will be harvested and subject to further down processing to make foods out of the cell culture because we do not consume the cell culture as such, but we consume foods derived from the cell culture. And that's the reason why we call it uh, cell culture derived foods. Yeah. Okay. And the down processing is the part where it's turned into presumably a product that looks like traditional meat, correct? Exactly, because the cells as such, as they grow, they look very different from, from muscle cells in, in, in an organism. Um, and the texture is probably different, the taste is probably different, if you would consume the pure cells as such. And uh, it's the task of, of food business operator who want to successful market and sell his products to then make out the product from these harvested cells that ideally looks like and tastes like conventional meat yeah okay and presumably we're talking about meat here but presumably this could also be the case for fish and maybe even fruit and vegetables is that right theoretically yes yeah 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 theoretically i'm saying because um for plants you can also grow plant cells um cultures derived from from plants but it's i think it's even more challenging for plants to resemble to mimic a product that looks like an apple or or a pear or, or vegetables. Yeah. Okay. And, and the real kind of reason behind doing this is, uh, at least from the producer's point of view, is to um, to avoid some of the, the issues that are related to uh, large-scale meat production, with sus- sustainability issues, animal welfare issues possibly, for example. Is, is, is that right? Exactly. These are the two main points and arguments for this new uh, innovative sector is, is to reduce animal welfare and, and health issues. And the second one is sustainability. And when we talk about sustainability, we know that plant vegetable production, food production is much cheaper than animal production. So for the industry, it would be more challenging to compete with vegetables or plants because they are produced in a much lower cost than meat is produced nowadays. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So I think the main interest will be indeed will be cell culture derived food based on animal cells. Yeah. Okay, we're, we're talking about a product that does exist on the market, if I understand well, in some other parts of the world, but is not yet on the market in in Europe. Is that right? That's correct. In Europe, we do not have such products yet on the market. 
Uh, the reason is because they are considered by regulators, by European Commission and member states as a novel food. And that requires an assessment, a safety assessment by EFSA and uh, the authorization by member states and the European Commission. But even before EFSA can assess a dossier, we need to receive one and we have not yet received such a dossier. Okay, but in other parts of the world, the, the, it, it's gone through a process and, and is on the market. Where, where is it possible actually to buy this kind of thing? Yes, there was uh, an authorization for chicken cell culture-based food in Singapore, I think it was last year. And, and this type of food is formulated like chicken nuggets. Yeah, so these products have the authorization in Singapore, but as we have heard, they are sold at very low uh, amounts. Uh, we heard about two kilograms per month. You, you, you talked about how uh, the cell lines are, are derived at the beginning. That You talked about there needing to be kind of an animal within the process, but could it be possible to remove the animal from the process and for this to be suitable for vegetarians and vegans if they're ethically you know, okay with the approach? That's a very personal decision. And I think it depends on how you define yourself, how strict the limits and uh, borders you impose on yourself to be vegetarian or uh, vegan. Somewhere these cells must be sourced um, from meat or from an animal. So they must have an animal origin. You do not necessarily need to slaughter an animal because you can also take it from meat, from certain parts of, of muscle cells. Um, and you can on, you can take it once and then you propagate a lot of these cells. You multiply them a lot in, in cell cultures. You can even freeze them. Uh, and later when you want to initiate a new batch of uh, such cell culture derived meat or food, you just thaw them. And then you start again propagating them, cultivating them, increase the scale and make again a new batch of this type of food. So you do not necessarily need to slaughter regularly animals. Yeah? Mm -hmm. You talked about there being such a, a, a relatively small quantity in Singapore. What are some of the challenges for these producers um, to, to get a product to, to a market like that? I think the biggest reason for, for the technological challenges is that these cells are taken out from the tissue from an organism. And in an organism, all the cells get the nourish, get the nutrients from capillars, they get the hormones from the blood, they have the interaction with all the other cells, and they are growing in a context of their neighbor cells, let's say, where there's a lot of interaction uh, between different type of cells. In cell culture derived foods, we're talking about cell culture based on a single type of cells, usually it's muscle, muscle cells. So we don't have capillars, we don't have hormone glands, we don't have a liver, kidney, we don't have other type of cells there. So all these must be replaced and mimicked. The conditions must be mimicked to come as close as possible to the environment cells have in an organism. But still, this environment is still very different. And that's, I think, it's a big challenge um, when it comes to large-scale production, because cells are easily to grow two-dimensional on a monolayer. But if you want to have meat, you need a three-dimensional structure. So you need to increase the number of cells that can grow over on the other, but you do not have vessels there. And one of the aim of the industry is to, to um, increase, to, to let them sell, the cells grow in a more three-dimensional way, to mimic the structure of a meat. And that's quite challenging. Mm -hmm. It's challenging in terms of yields, especially. Mm -hmm. I think that's one of the reasons why these type of products have yet not been that successful. But there's a lot of technology ongoing. And uh, I think we should not underestimate innovation um, when there is also sufficient funding to support that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So we've talked a little bit about what it is, the process, um, some of the reasons behind it, some of the challenges. What about uh, the safety of the product? We, you said we haven't received an application yet, but what are some of the, the things that we will look at in terms of the safety of, of an application for this? Indeed, we have not yet received such an application, but we have started uh, thinking, discussing, and we also have organized events such as the uh, scientific colloquium in May in Brussels this year. And we are going to organize stakeholder meetings on, on that topic as well. Also to exchange with stakeholders, with scientists from universities, but also with the industry part. 
to get more knowledge about this type of products. We are quite confident that we are already prepared for that. And we expect that the hazards related to these type of foods are not dissimilar to what we are facing now with conventional food productions. What are the hazards? The hazards are uh, chemical and microbiological hazards. So basically everything what you feed into our farmed animals, that includes also contamination from, from the feed, pesticides, food additives, sometimes antibiotics, um, contamination from the environment, industry, from emissions, everything that is fed to animals that they consume, that they are exposed in the environment, could end up on our plates. There are a lot of regulations to limit all these contaminations and chemical hazards, and the same applies to microbiological hazards. We know all these Salmonella, Campylobacter, other microbes that can affect meat and, and other foods, and basically we face the same challenges uh, with regards to the cell culture derived foods. So everything you put into the medium where the cells grow, and you need to put a lot of uh, products there, basically nutrients, vitamins, but also somehow, somehow you need to make the cells grow. So some growth factors are probably, probably needed. Um, also these ingredients you put there are never 100% pure. We expect that they are pure enough to uh, ensure safe food products, but these are the items we will look when we are assessing such type of products. So it's it's uh, the chemical hazards we will look, um, residuals, potential residuals in a final product, as well as microbiological contamination. And third is, uh, in our assessment, we look also to the nutritional composition of these type of foods. We are obliged to do so, because the novel food regulation says a novel food should not be disadvantages uh, to the European consumer with, with regards to its nutrients. So these products should not be worse, let's say, than uh, what we are consuming already right now. And, and how do you think it would compare actually to a traditional meat product? We expect to, that there will be some differences, but uh, not necessarily that these differences are disadvantages for the European consumers. So I would expect that uh, this hurdle will be passed by the industry, by these type of products. They will be somehow similar in terms of composition because also the cells growing there, they need the same, what the cells are need in an organism. So they need all the micronutrients, vitamins will be there, proteins will be there sufficiently. Same quality with some differences, but not necessarily that the quality will be less than the proteins uh, mm -hmm. when we talk about conventional meat. Yeah. The, the fact that it's a closed system, I guess, is an advantage in one way because you can really control the environment uh, to a very specific degree, but it could also be a disadvantage, a risk, in that if anything does get into the system that perhaps shouldn't be there, contaminants or whatever, it affects the entire system. Is that right? Absolutely correct. Yeah. So I think when you have a contamination in a cell culture, you would very quickly realize because the cells, there's no immune system. So there will be nothing in the in the cell culture that would fight against a microbial contamination. So this batch will be very quickly spoiled and you can discharge it. And that's a bit different to when we talk about farmed animals where you could have infections that are for a long time not observed. And once you spot them, uh, it could have passed already quite, I mean, the worst example we know is the, is the BSE crisis where it mm -hmm. took years to, to even realize what's going on there. Yeah. And when people have already consumed this type of products, I think that will be different in terms of the cell culture where you quickly will see uh, there is microbiological contamination and basically it's spoiled within one day. Yeah. It would not reach consumers. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Another question that springs to my mind is uh, when we look at some of the critics who talk about these products, they use words such as, they call it artificial meat or synthetic meat. Um, do you think that's an accurate reflection, actually, of the process here? I mean, these are not that, these are not terms we are using in our scientific discussions. That's rather subject to people outside of EFSA. Personally, I think uh, when we talk about synthesis, we rather think about chemical synthesis, and these products are not chemically synthesized. So, as a scientist, I would disagree with the term synthetic. When it comes to artificial uh, versus natural meat, I also have. A different view. 
because what is what is a natural food production that would be for me I, as I would define it is I go to the forest and collect my mushrooms my berries and maybe I need even to get a fish from the sea um, or to hunt my own animal that would be the natural way of my own food production yeah, I wouldn't call the conventional industrial farming and agriculture as natural versus the artificial uh, cell culture production so for me it's both both are in a kind of artificial because they are not anymore collected uh, and produced as as we did maybe a thousand years ago. <laughs> mm. Yeah, I guess in a way a lot will depend on uh, the choices of consumers when presumably these products do make it to market. What's going to be the cost? What's going to be the attitude of consumers, the taste, etc.? All these factors come into play when consumers make their decisions. On that front, how, how do you see it for the industry in terms of the, the cost of production? I have um, less insight on, on this aspect. So we are more in, in the science and uh, to prepare for the safety assessment as such. I'm less investigating and, and following the cost side. I think there's also a big challenge there uh, for the industry uh, to have large scale production that could compete with the price of, of meat, uh, of the conventional meat at this moment. Yeah, there is a certain development ongoing. Of course, the more funding, the larger the scale production could be and the more cheaper the price is. But uh, when and whether um, there could be really competition in terms of price with the conventional meat, I seriously don't know. Mm. It's difficult, I think. Yeah, as you said, it's out of our our remit in any case and another thing that we hear from uh, applicants sometimes is they talk about uh, the challenge of getting a product to market in terms of the eu system the rules in place etc and they talk of bureaucratic burden uh what what do you say to that indeed they need uh, uh to make a, sub a submission and application which then uh, needs to be assessed by efsa uh, and even after the efsa assessment uh, there is a procedure of i think it's seven months for European Commission and member states to authorize this type of food. So it, it could take some time to get an authorization. The reason is because European states have decided to ensure a high level of, of consumer safety. And that takes a process that takes a while for the risk assessment. And even after the risk assessment, the member states, European Commission could take other considerations into account as well. Uh, and this process takes time. Um, and the reason is, I think, overall, because EU has probably the highest standard in terms of, of food safety, in, probably on a global scale even. Yeah. Okay, so it could be a bit of time before I can go to a supermarket and choose some cell-derived uh, meat if I wanted to. Yes, certainly the reason is not because uh, we want to, to stop this type of foods, this innovation. That's EFSA is not in a position and we, we would not have this intention at all. And I think also the European Commission doesn't have this intention. The reason is really consumer safety. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, one final question to you on a personal level, Wolfgang. How, how did you end up here? What was your path towards becoming part of EFSA's Novel Foods team and assessing, you know, these kind of novel products? I'm Bastardi, I'm, I'm a veterinary. Um, so I'm quite familiar with uh, animal production, animal health, animal welfare issues. Uh, but then I also have uh, some years of experience in, in research, also using a lot of cells in biotechnology. Um, I was working for a few years in, in assessing safety and efficacy of, of medicines, including biotechnology products. And as such, um, I also learned about uh, certain guideline documents from European Medicine Agency with regards to cell culture and biotechnology-derived products. And uh, since 2003, uh, I started in EFSA at the beginning with BSE, uh, with the BSE issue, and later on, I moved to the nutrition unit uh, and quickly I got the, the novel foods on my plates, uh, which I deal now since 2006. Okay, well, thanks very much, Wolfgang, for giving us your, your insights and expertise. Thanks for joining us on this episode of uh, Science on the Menu, and we hope to see you again soon. Thank you very much.